we just thank you for this morning and thank you that you are here. Lord, we pray that as we sing and we come before you and worship, Lord, that you would be praised and that we would be thinking of you, especially during this um, Easter season, Lord, that you would be on the forefront of our mind and we would be thankful that you're sacrificed to give us eternal life. So, Lord, as we come into your presence and we come and we worship you and we get our hearts ready to hear your word, Lord, would you be at the forefront of it? Would it not be about our agendas or these desires that we have for you to fulfill? Um, but would it be the one true desire, and it's you? We just want to see you. We want to behold you in this place. So, Lord, you're welcome. You're welcome to come. Um, we just want to see you. We want to lift your name up. So we thank you and we love you in this place, Lord. In your name, amen. Presence, fill our praise, fill our praise. Come and let your presence fill this place. Oh, come and let your presence fill our praise, fill our praise. Come and let your presence fill this place. Come and let your presence fill our praise, fill our praise. Come and let your presence fill this place. Come and let your presence fill our praise, fill our praise. Come and let your presence fill this place for you. You are the one we want to meet. Oh, Jesus, shine through. All the praises that we sing, we sing. And we have come to give you highest praise, highest praise. We have come to love you in this place. We have come to give you highest praise, highest praise. Oh, we have come to love you in this place for you. You are the one we want to meet. Oh, Jesus, shine through all the praises that we sing. Oh, for You're the one we want to meet, and Jesus shine through all the praises that we say, cause it's all for you, so here we are. It's all for you. Here we are, here we are. Yes, it's all for you. Here we are, here we are. Oh, it's all for you. Jesus, shine through all the praises that we say, cause it's all for you, oh 
It's all for you. Here we are, here we are. But it's all for you. Here we are, here we are. Oh, for you. You are the one. Jesus, shine through all the praises that we sing. Oh, we sing. darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life and Oh, you reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name, Jesus, you reign above it all, and on the cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. So from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem arise. Because Jesus, you're alive. And you reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. And let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. We'll sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. For you sent the darkness running out of the empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, you're enthroned on the highest place. Lord, you sent the darkness running out of the empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, you're enthroned on the highest praise. Oh, you sent the darkness running out of the empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, you're enthroned on the highest praise. And you reign above it all, you reign above it all. You're over the universe and over every heart. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. So let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. We'll sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, 
So spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. And spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Lord, spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. And spirit of revelation, open my heart I want to see you, Lord, I want to see you, see you right the Jesus, I want to see you, Lord, I want to see you. See you right the Jesus. Open up our eyes, Lord. Open up our eyes, Lord. Oh, spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. And spirit of revelation. Open my heart again, the spirit of wisdom. Open my eyes again, and spirit of revelation. Open my heart, cause I want to see you. Yes, Lord, I want to see you, see you right the Jesus, I, I have to see you, Lord, I, I have to see you, see you right the Jesus, we'll see you right the Jesus. I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your head is white as wool. And I know your voice, it sounds like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful. And I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your head is white as wool. And I know that your voice, it sounds like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful, and I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice, it sounds like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful, and I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice, it sounds like waters. Oh, Jesus, you're beautiful, and there is none like you. 
Jesus, you're beautiful. Yes, Jesus, you're beautiful. Oh, Jesus, you're beautiful. And there is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. There is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. No, there is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. There is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. There is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. There is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth and there is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth no there is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth and there is none like you lord jesus your beautiful Oh, there is none like you, Lord. Jesus, you're beautiful. Oh, Jesus, you're beautiful. Yes, Jesus, you're beautiful. We say, Jesus, you're beautiful. Oh, Jesus, you're beautiful. Yes, Jesus, you're beautiful. So turn your eyes upon Jesus, Lord, for in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strange be dim in the light of his glory and grace yes turn your eyes upon jesus lord full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strange, be dim in the light of his glory and grace. And the things of earth will grow strange, be dim in the light of his glory and grace. In the light of his glory and grace. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that in light of you, when we're here in your presence, Lord, when 
we can sit here and we can just behold you for who you are. And we can think about you with eyes like flames of fire, with your head as white as wool, Lord. Whatever that looks like, we know that it's beautiful. We know that Jesus, our Savior, you are beautiful. And we pour out our worship to you, Lord, because you're worthy of it. In spite of all the circumstances in our lives, you're worthy of it. You're worthy of our worship, Lord. You're worthy of our praise. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you so much for coming down and living this perfect example of a life so that we can walk with you and we can turn our eyes upon you. But Lord, we also turn our eyes upon the cross that you hung on and you died on so that we could have eternal life. And we turn our eyes to the empty grave that you rose from. Jesus, there is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. You truly do reign above everything, Lord. And we recognize you as that perfect sacrifice, as that perfect Savior, as that perfect King. We love you in this place, Jesus. Turn our hearts to you as we hear your word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, worship team. A um, couple of quick announcements before we get into this morning's message to make you aware of. Um, if you look in your bulletin, we have worship night for this Thursday. Actually, it is going to not be happening this Thursday. Cage is heading out of town today. Um, so you can strike that out of your, your bulletin if you put it in your calendar. I'm sorry I didn't mention it to you last week, uh, but there is no worship night this upcoming Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, but we will be having Good Friday service from 4 to 7 p.m. Um, Journey to the Cross, it's just that interactive prayer walk. Um, so you can come, it can take anywhere from 20 minutes to probably, you know, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes on the long end. Um, if you took your time walking through it and just kind of meditating through the different um, stations that you go through. So that's this upcoming Friday, April 7th from 4 to 7. Uh, men's breakfast is Saturday. Um, Easter Sunday is April 9th. And then Friday, or April 23rd, so three weeks out, um, we're having a potluck following service. So if you're interested, you know, to stay and to share a fellowship meal with one another, um, get to know one another, um, interact with one another a little bit more, maybe beyond surface stuff and just be able to have a meal. Um, Sunday, April 23rd is your opportunity to do that um, and be able to participate. And lastly but not least is the baby bottles. If you took them, I've gotten several of them back already. Um, I would say we're probably about halfway back. Um, if we can get these back by the 16th of April, so if you've taken one and you still have it at home, by the 16th of April, if we can get those back and then we can get them to the Life Outreach Center. Um, and they can take those bottles, get them cleaned up, and sent off to another church. Um, so that's an opportunity there. I think there's still a few back there um, on the table um, if you're interested in one and have not done that so yet. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get into the, this morning's message. Um, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, it's, been a, it's been a rough week. Um, so if it seems a little dry, it's probably because it's coming from me. It's not coming from the Lord. It's because I'm a little dry. Um, I've been sitting here pondering this morning, you know, as I, you know, see you rightly, Jesus, right, that whole song. Um, and I was thinking about the song, um, it's an older song uh, from the preacher preaching when the well is dry. Um, and so I kind of feel dry. So if that is the case, that's coming from me. I'm just going to, you know, cut that off right now at the front end. Um, so be praying down that road. Um, this morning is obviously Palm Sunday. Um, we celebrate the Lord's coming into his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I'm going to be reminded of that truth. Um, I've been preaching that for, I don't know, 17 years. And it's like, okay, so where do we go with this? Right? We could talk about Jesus is coming into town. It's in all four of the Gospels. So obviously it's an important thing. We do need to understand it. We need to see the, um, the picture of it, if you will, um, and allow that to happen. But what I hope to do this morning is to look at three lessons that we can learn, three lessons that I believe the disciples learned um, on that first Palm Sunday. And so let's go ahead and flip to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 19, we'll, le we'll read Luke's account of the triumphal entry. Like I said, it's found in all four Gospels, um, and if you have time this week, I encourage you to go through and kind of look at that and see all the, the, the praise and the glory and the honor that is that Christ receives as he enters into Jerusalem, but the crazy thing about that is when you look at it throughout the week, Monday, you know, he comes in triumphal entry, everybody's praising and glorifying him, come Friday they're yelling crucify him, and all these things change. 
Um, and I debated kind of going down that road a little bit. And you start to think about the fact that sometimes we're a little finicky like that too, right? We're all glory, you know, glory in God on Sunday morning, and all of a sudden things don't go the way we want throughout the week, and we get to the end of the week, and we're grumbling and complaining about things to the Lord, and we're like, you know, what is there even the purpose of any of this? And maybe that's where they're at. And so we can understand it maybe to a little degree. Um, so now if you've gotten to Luke chapter 19, verse 29, and when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where you're entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord is in need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the rocks would cry out. Right? The rocks would cry out. And so we see this, this account, right? And obviously Jesus sends his disciples. They go find the colt. They bring the colt back. Jesus gets on it. They ride in. Everybody's putting palm branches and glorifying God, right? Hosanna, rejoicing in who he is. Um, you know, the, the, those who loved him and saw all of his miracles glorified him. And I think that's the opportunity we have, obviously, every Sunday is to, to be reminded of the miracles and the things that we've seen of him and to glorify him in those moments, right? And to praise him all throughout the day, not just on Sunday, but 24-7, 365, but... Did you notice at the end of that passage, right, the religious leaders, right, some of the Pharisees of the crowd, of the Pharisees in the crowd said to the teacher, rebuke your disciples. Right, how often is it, right, that a lot of times religious people get upset by Jesus Christ? Right, we have no, they have no problem with God the Father, but they have a problem with Jesus coming into the mix because Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes the whole picture and the dynamic of what's going on, and so he tells them to rebuke his disciples, and Jesus says, obviously, he goes, if they don't cry out, the rocks will. Right? If they don't cry out, the rocks will, verse 40. And so here's a question for you to kind of start this morning off before we get into a couple of the lessons, right? How many of us want rocks to take our place? Right? Unfortunately, how many times do rocks take our place? Right, because we don't cry out, because we don't praise, because we don't glorify God for the many blessings that he's provided in our lives, the many miracles that we've seen, right? Because chances are, right, and I, and I just kind of listed for myself, right, I, I've seen miracles he's done, that right? I've seen him open the ears of a, of a deaf man. I've been participating, you know, I was part of that. I've seen that happen. I've seen him multiply food. I've seen him, you know, I've seen lives changed. I've seen marriages transformed. But I've seen all of these things happen, and yet so often I find myself not in the midst of praising and glorifying God in those seasons. Right? And that just shouldn't be the case. But sometimes it is for us, right? And so it's just a challenge to remind ourselves that we need to constantly put ourselves in this position to glorify the Lord and, and to, to, to praise Him for all the things that He has done. Because as they had seen there, right, they already knew the miracles that He had done. They all, all the mightier works that they had seen. What mightier works of God have you seen? Right, what has he done in your life personally or in friends and family and co-workers that you have seen that maybe you haven't given him the praise, honor, and glory that he deserves? Right, so just challenge you with that here this morning before we get into the, the three lessons that I want us to see. And those three lessons are these. The first thing we learn is that we, are, we must serve with humility. Let's go back to Matthew's version of the triumphal entry, Matthew 21. We're going to see very similar wording, Matthew 21. first thing we learn is that we must serve with humility. I think a lot of times we look at the disciples and we think it must have all been like this glorious time and this, you know, these wonderful times with Jesus. And yes, there was a lot of that going on in their lives, but there was a lot of just mundane things that sometimes they, you know, if we struggled with them, they probably struggled with them too. Right? There were some things that they did that Jesus asked them to do that maybe we don't like either. So verse 21, chapter 21, verse 1. 
Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Right, so these disciples, right, they've been walking with Jesus. They've been living with Christ. Right, they had this relationship with him. Right, there's this, there's this, this, this connection there. And he goes, all these things are taking place, but now I need you to just go get a donkey. Just go get a donkey. And I don't know about you, but if I'm sitting there walking with Jesus, and you know, maybe we don't know all the people in town, but he's like, go to town, and by the way, you're going to see this, this donkey over here. Just go on and tie it and bring it back to me. How many of us would be like, Sure, I'll go. Right? Chances are we'd all probably maybe sit there a little bit and go, this is a little weird. And I, I ain't just going to grab somebody's donkey either. Right? That's somebody else's donkey. It's not mine. And now I'm going to go in and then i got to actually speak and go, well, the Lord needs it. Right? But it takes them to, to humble themselves. And when you need to remember, right, there's this glorious side of it. The Gospels say that Jesus gave these same disciples power to preach and heal the sick in his name, correct? Jesus gives the power to the twelve, he gives it to the seventy-two, and he sends them out. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and to heal all kinds of diseases. And then the seventy-two get sent out, and they go out and they cast out demons and they heal the sick, and all this stuff is going on, right? So they're seeing all this, this boisterous ministry and success. But then Jesus goes, stop for a minute. I know you've been playing center stage. I know that you've been out there in the forefront. But now I just need you to go get me a donkey. Jesus, isn't that something better for me to do? That don't you have somebody that I need to go, you know, cast out a demon? or go, do I, do, Isn't there somewhere I can go and preach the gospel? And he's like, no, no, no. I just need you to go get a donkey. And Jesus has this tendency to take us from this place of stage and out front and to bring us back to a place of humility and going, Will you serve me because I've asked you? Will you humble yourself and just do the simple little thing that I've asked you to do, whatever that might be? And so one pastor that I was reading to this week, he goes, instead of working miracles and healing the sick, we find these two, these two disciples, in the words of one pastor, on donkey duty. Right? On donkey duty. And, and you think about that, and you know, maybe we don't think a whole lot about it, but you've got to remember, right, back in their day, Right? People who had donkeys were poor people. There were people that were typically pretty uneducated. Right? There were people that were kind of, you know, that just didn't have all the privileges and the opportunities and the, and the things that are out there. And you've got to remember, the disciples are sitting here going, Jesus says he's going to be the king and he's going to do all these things and he's going to set his people free. And now i got to go get a donkey? And so it would be a humiliating thing to have to lead a donkey out of town. And so if I were to ask you this morning, right, would you serve on donkey duty, who would be willing to do it? And it's a, and it's a, and it's a valid question, and obviously I'm not going to go ask you to get a donkey, but it could be any small, menial task in God's kingdom. And the question is, are we willing to go and do those things? Not because of any fanfare, not because of any recognition, simply because Jesus asked us. And there's the challenge, there's the thing that Jesus is teaching his disciples, is that it takes humility to serve him. Flip with me, if you will, to the Gospel of John. And so Matthew says that Jesus tells him to go forth. And here's the amazing thing about Jesus again. He doesn't ask his disciples to do anything that he's not willing to do. Right? If Jesus was one of the disciples, would he have gone and got the donkey? I think he would have gone in a heartbeat. You need somebody to go get a donkey, I'm in. No problem, I'll go. I don't think Jesus ever saw a task that was below him, if you will. Right? And, and, and I think this is the key. Right? God isn't looking, Jesus isn't looking for um, superstars. He's not looking for celebrities. Right? Jesus is looking for those humble servants who are willing to do what he asks of them. And it may, mean, it may mean that you're in the spotlight, but it also may mean you're not. And so Jesus himself demonstrates this to his disciples in the upper room. Right? They're there right, preparing for the Passover, right? Jesus then gets up and he does what? In John chapter 13, right? He starts to wash their feet. John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. We want to talk about a menial task. 
Right? Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, verse 3, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. All these disciples, right, walking to share a meal, right, all laying there, lounging around a table, none of them willing to wash feet. Jesus walks in, right? Rabbi, teacher, master, Lord, the one that they all looked up to, and he's like, none of them are going to wash feet. Really? All right, that's fine. All right, teaching moment. An right, opportunity for me to come in and to break in. And he doesn't say a word. He doesn't get up. He doesn't do nothing. He just he gets up. He puts a towel around his waist. He gets the water. He starts washing feet. The very feet that maybe walked in donkey duty. Right, the, 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 the feet that, I mean, it, it wasn't a clean situation at all. And yet he was willing to wash feet. And then if you slide a little further, right, all of that's done. Verse 12, John chapter, 13, of John chapter 13, when he had washed their feet, he, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for, I, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Are we willing to follow the example? Right, as followers of Christ, are we willing to follow that example of taking the lowliest of the lowliest of the lowliest of servants and doing it with joy? And of doing it with this heart that says, you know what, there's nothing beneath me. And I think that's what Jesus is talking to his disciples all in the same moment. He goes, I'm asking you to humble yourself and, and be on donkey duty. I'm asking you to just go do this menial task for me. Will you do it? And I think he's asking us the same thing this week. Right? It, it, God's kingdom is different than the world. The world rates our standard based off of our stage, off of our status, correct? If you have the right job. If you have the right house, if you have the right amount of money, then you have this power and you have this prestige, correct? That's the way of the world. God's kingdom isn't that way, church. God's kingdom reverses that and throws it on its head. And it says, you know what, if you want to be great in my kingdom, right, you're going to be recognized by how you serve. He who wants to be greatest among you must be what? Servant of everybody. Right, that if we want greatness in God's kingdom, right, we're going to be recognized by how we serve. And so the question for you this morning is, right, it's not about how loud you shout or sing praise or glorify God with your voice. Right, that's important. I'm not saying get rid of that aspect of worship and praise and, and your walk with the Lord. Right? But that's not really what it's about because all of those people were standing there shouting and crying out, Hosanna and glorify and praise for the one who's come from the Father and all this stuff. At the end of the week, they're crowning crucified. So the question is, right, it, it's not about that. The question is, is it's about how well do you serve as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do you serve well? And that looks varied across the board. There's a million ways to do that service, but the question is, is do you serve well? Because Scripture is very clear, right? If you do serve, right, if you are willing to lay down your life in humble service to the king, right, one day you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I pray that that's our heart's cry. Right? It's not about you know, this recognition from a worldly perspective. It's the recognition in the eternal perspective. Because we might get recognition in the worldly perspective for what we do, and we might not. There's, there's a good chance that in the service of God's king, we won't receive recognition here. As a matter of fact, we'll get the absolute opposite. We'll get persecution and ridicule and all of those things from the world. And we should expect that from them. Right? But we have this in the back of our mind that our, heart, that our God and our Lord is sitting there going, there's my servant. They're willing to do anything I ask. Willingly laying down their lives for me and for other people. So that's the first lesson, is that we must be willing to be humble in our service to one another. The second lesson 
thing that we see is that your internal identity is, is more important than your image. Image is everything in the U.S., no? It's all about the image we present, unfortunately. Right? And, and, and I shouldn't just say in the U.S., but probably around the world in that regard. I don't know that the U.S. is any different in that regard, but Jesus wants his disciples to know that greatness comes from who you are and not so much by what you have. And again, right, I think we intellectually know that in the church, but so often I think even in the church, our greatness is deemed by what we have. Right? How many people are sitting in the pews? How many people are involved in our Bible study? How many people read our book? How many people follow us on our, you know, on, on our Facebook page? Or whatever those things are, right? We still base it off of what we've accumulated. We go, they must be really important in God's kingdom because they have all these followers. Really? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe they're just really good at, 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 at swelling up, at, you know, this excitement and this fanfare, and they get that attention. But doesn't mean they're great in God's kingdom. Doesn't mean that that's where they're at. That doesn't mean where their identity is. And so Jesus is like, I want your identity to understand. I want you to understand that right, your value, your internal identity, is far more important than any image you can put out there. That you don't need those things of the world to be great in God's eyes. And I know that's not sometimes hard to accept, but it's true. We don't need those things. And Jesus, I think, gives us two pictures. And one of them we don't necessarily see in the Scripture. Um, historical accounts talk about it. Um, we're talking about Jesus' triumphal entry um, and his coming into Jerusalem. But on that same day, right, history would say that Pilate enters from the other side of town. And there's two very different images of the entries that take place that day. And I'm just going to kind of go through them real quickly with us. Right? Obviously, we've already seen Jesus, right? Jesus is coming in on the colt of a donkey. Did you ever stop to picture what that looks like for a minute? I don't think Jesus was a really small guy. I just don't. Right? I, I, maybe he was. I don't know, right? I mean, but I don't think he was really tiny. I don't think there's this petite little jockey type guy that looked, you know, natural on, on the colt. Right? The donkey's colt was pretty small. And so when you look at it in that perspective, right, can you just stop for a minute and, and picture Jesus riding in a donkey, a 33-year-old man coming in on the colt of a donkey. Chances are, right, his feet are almost touching the ground. Right, he's way off balance. It just, it, I mean, he probably, is, you know, it, just, it, it looks awkward, right? It looks uncomfortable. It doesn't look natural at all. But right? it shouldn't be the case, right? So I'm, one of the passages that I read goes, it'd be like him riding on a little, you know, little kids, little mini bike type of thing to put him on that seat. It would be the same thing. It's not natural. But that's what Jesus chooses to come in on, right? He didn't, it, but it didn't seem, the amazing thing is, is throughout the whole picture, it doesn't seem to bother the people that he's on a donkey, does it? The people standing there around, right, lining the streets, shouting Hosanna, laying palm branches, laying cloaks, they didn't seem to notice and it didn't seem to bother them that Jesus is riding on a donkey. Like, oh, whatever. I know who he is. Right? I understand what he's like. We've experienced his goodness. We've experienced his love. We've experienced his compassion. Right? I've seen his miracles. Right? It, all of that stuff is there. And so riding on a donkey, riding on a horse, doesn't matter. I'm okay with it because I know the man sitting on the donkey. Right? Do we know that man sitting on on the donkey. Matthew 21.10 says, and, and when he had came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Who is this man? Right? Who is this one who rides in on a donkey? Right? And they were asking the question, because what's going on? Right? He's receiving all the fanfare. Is this the one who's going to deliver us from the Romans? Is he the man that's going to finally set us free from this oppression? You know, is he a prophet? Is he a holy man? Is this the Messiah? They, they're all asking this question. There's people asking it around. And the amazing thing is, to me, we know the answer to those questions, correct? We know who the man riding in on, on, on the donkey is now. We don't have to wonder. They did. They didn't know for sure. But we do know who Christ is. Right? We do know that he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Slide with me backwards to the Old Testament. Go to the book of Zechariah. Where is that? Right, if you have, got, go to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and then go back a book, and you'll hit Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9. 
that he speaks of this truth, he speaks of this reality, he shows and he, and he foretells about Christ coming in on the colt of a donkey, right? And so the Jews should have known this. It should have been a, a known fact to them, a picture of the coming king. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Right? And so basically, when they see him coming in on a donkey, right, they're like, this is our king. How many of us would expect our king to come in on a donkey? Probably none of us. Right? That's not what a king rides. Right? No king comes in on a donkey. No king comes in with no army. Right? How is Jesus possibly going to set them free? from the oppression of the Romans when he's got nothing. Zero. Right? And this is the image. This is what's coming in, right? But the amazing thing is, is Jesus didn't need any of those worldly things to show who he was. Because he knew who he was. Right? Jesus knew he was the king of kings. Jesus knew that he had legions of angels at his disposal. He didn't need all of that fan, all the worldly fanfare to ride in and to proclaim peace to the people. And in a couple different scenarios of it, as he was living with the people, right, if you were to just kind of jot these in your notes, in John chapter 8, verse 58, right, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I was. Right? So Jesus is proclaiming to be God right, before them. John chapter 10, verse 30, he tells his listeners, he goes, I and the Father are one. Right? So he's connecting himself back to God again. Right? He's proclaiming who he is. He knows he's the Son of God. He knows he's the one who came to save the world. John chapter 17, verse 5, right, Jesus' high priestly prayer. John 17, 5, he says, Glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Right, so Jesus is making all these proclamations of who he was, that he wasn't confused about his identity. And I believe that we too need to be aware of what our identity is in Christ. And that's a teaching that he's giving us here this morning. John chapter 18, though, I want you to flip there. John 18. Jesus is in the garden. Judas comes up to him, right? Judas is there to betray him over to them. Um, and I don't know how many of you have read this, but it's really kind of an amazing statement that's there. Um, and I, just to, to see the picture and to see the power of Christ and the words that he has and the identity of who he is. John chapter 18, verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you see? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Right, just the proclamation of his mouth, right, just the, 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 the understanding of who he was, right, the power in that causes them to draw back and fall to the, you know, fall to the ground. Right? And I mean, so just that picture alone, right, if that causes me, this man speaks, right, and I'm just thinking of the guys with Judas. Right, they're walking with him. They're going to do these things. Right? They've done it probably a thousand times. They've gone and arrested people. No issues. And yet they come to this guy in the garden. No weapons, no fanfare, no armies, no nothing at his disposal. And like, like, hey, who are you looking for? They're like, I'm looking for Jesus. Like, yeah, that's me. I'm him. And it causes them to step back and fall to the ground. And then they get up and they proceed anyway. Right, just an amazing thing to think about, that, that picture and the power that's there. Right, in Christ, in his words. And so, in the first, you know, that, that, that's just the amazing part about it. And then he tells Pilate, right, you have no authority over me, except what's been given to you. Pilate, you think you're causing me to lay down my life? Because you're not causing me to do nothing. But I'm choosing to lay my life down, and I'll choose to pick it back up again. And so that's Jesus' entry in, right, this picture of, I know who I am, and, and that's where I stand. No, I have no fear of anything. Right, there's my triumphal entry. But as I said, there's an entry on the other side. Right, the other side of town, if you will, right, you start to compare that with the, with the entry of Pilate. And we're not necessarily familiar with it, one, one commentary says. He goes, but the imperial procession was well known in the Jewish homeland in the first century. It was the standard practice of the Roman governors of Judea to be in Jerusalem for the major Jewish festivals. But it was normal, it was common. If there's a Jewish festival going on in Jerusalem, governors and such are coming into town. Right? They're going to be present in that situation. 
And you know, some would say, well, maybe it's because they wanted to understand the reverence for the religious devotion. Not really. Right? The, the Romans were coming in. Pilate was there with all of his fanfares, right, in case there was trouble. In case there was all of a sudden this upheaval that takes place because of all that's going on. They were there to squash any kind of rebellion that was taking place. So this is Pilate's entry on the flip side of it. So Jesus comes in riding on the colt of a donkey, zero armies, zero fanfare. Yet on the flip side, right, here comes Pilate. Pilate's was a military procession. It was a demonstration of the Roman imperial power. So there's cavalry on horses, right? There's you know, multiple horses, men on them. There's foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets and weapons. There's banners all over, right? Golden eagles mounted on poles, right, as they're standing there, right? The guy, one of them continues on, sun glinting on metal and gold. The sounds were the marching of feet, the creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, the beating of drums, and the swirl of dyes, right? Fanfare galore. Why? Pilate's coming to town and he's going, Law, but I understand you're getting together for your little, you know, your little religious festival, but don't get carried out of way because we're here to take care of you if you do. The true power lies with us. The true power lies with Caesar. Not any God that you say you proclaim. And so he takes all the world's fanfare, which so often impresses people, right? And he goes, pay attention. I'm in town. Don't get carried away. Right? And then unfortunately, when you think about the Jews in that day, but you, you, you think about him walking right into the town, is that not the one that would be more prominent in our mind's eye? Let's see. Jesus riding in on a donkey. He's supposed to be king. Here comes this governor with armies galore riding on a war horse. Who am I following? Right? Where's my identity lie? Should my identity lie in the things of the world? Or should my identity lie in who I am in Christ? And so for the disciples of Jesus, right, in those times, right, this, these processions are a sermon, if you will. How would they live their lives? Is it all about what I project myself to be? Or is it all about who I know I am? Am I comfortable in who I am? Am I confident in who I am in Christ? Are you? Or are we putting out an image, projecting an image to people so that they think certain, certain things? Right? Pilate chooses a horse. Jesus chooses a donkey. Pilate comes in with a show of force. Jesus enters in as a place of servant. And of, of, you know, of humility down here. What about you? Where do we stand when we come with Jesus? Do we come in as a servant? Or do we come in up here as somebody who has everything? A quick question for us to challenge us as we go through. Go back to the book of Zechariah real quick. Zechariah chapter 9. We read just one verse there, but we want to continue that story because we understand what else is said. Zechariah chapter 9. So Jesus, he, Zechariah proclaims and pro- prophesies about the fact that he's coming in on a donkey, on the coal of a donkey. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow, battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from river, from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse 11, As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. And so there's this prophecy of Gennon going, you know, he's going to come in and he's going to proclaim peace. And there's going to be all this fanfare on the other side. But I don't need that. I'm just going to proclaim peace. Right? And he allows himself to come in and he proclaims that to a people. Right? And because he knows that he was coming in to suffer for the sake of other people. For your sake. For my sake. That we might actually have peace. Peace that all of the, the worldly strength that's out there can never bring. Right? Do we not live in that reality today? Right? There is wars, there's countries out there that have all of this stuff. And do we have peace? No. There's no peace in worldly strength. 
but that peace doesn't exist. You have a, an image or a facade of peace, but it's not really there. So let me ask you a quick, simple question. Do you know who you are this morning? Because a lot depends upon that. Right? Jesus knew who he was, so he didn't need all the fanfare of the world. Do we understand the power and the authority that we've been given in Christ? Do we truly accept that as, as, as true? Right? Another question is, do you need the things of the world to feel good? Do you need the, 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 the fanfare to feel like you've got importance or status or position? Or do we step back and go, you know what? I'm a child of the king. I'm an ambassador of heaven. That all this stuff is mine, not because of anything I've done, but because of everything that Christ has done. That that's who I sit at. And so one um, commentary says this, if you're a child of God and a servant of the kingdom, then when you walk into the boardroom, you are salt and light. I don't know if any of you are going to walk into boardrooms on Monday, right, or tomorrow, but you might, right? And, and if that's the case, right, your power and your authority walking into the boardroom is not because of all the worldly accolades. Right? It's because of who Christ has made you to be and walk in that confidence. Because when you walk on the job and you've been praying, you carry with you the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? When you go to work tomorrow, you go to school tomorrow, right? you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit indwelling you, going with you in that spot. What more authority do you need? What more power is there than that? Right? And so there's an importance in that. And then this one, I just I, I put this one in there. When you're at Easter dinner next week, right, you're not just Uncle Joe's nephew. Right? And maybe that doesn't apply to us as adults so much, right? Maybe it's more when we were little kids where you're so-and-so, right? But, you know, oh, that's my nephew. Well, that's not just who you are, right? I think we have to allow that to change ourselves, right? That doesn't identify me. Instead, you're an ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? You're not Uncle Joe's nephew. Right? When you're at Easter dinner next week, right, you're an ambassador for God's kingdom. Live like it. Walk like it. Right? Love people like that's true. That you're an ambassador of another kingdom. And then live in the fullness of that. Your internal identity is far more than anything you project. And if you lose your job, if you lose your home, if you lose your car, Right? It doesn't change the fact that you're a child of God, does it? Oh, but it doesn't feel as good. Well, maybe it doesn't feel as good. Maybe that's not as comfortable. But it doesn't change the fact that you're his son or that you're his daughter. Right? We need to live in that identity. Don't let the worldly image trump our internal identity. And then lastly, our obedience is not connected to popularity. Jesus was pretty popular on Sunday, right? Comes in fanfare, crowds, screaming, hollering, right, praising. Right? There's all this fanfare when he comes in. And as I said a moment ago, right, by the end of the week, they're like, throw him out. Right? Give us Barabbas. Give us a murderer. Give us somebody who should never, ever see the streets. But give us him. He's better than Jesus, right? So Jesus' popularity plummets through the floor, right? And here's the amazing thing that there, I think the disciples learned. And and, and we know they learned it because as they got through the rest of their lives, they too were crucified. Peter was crucified. Right? All, the, all the disciples, for the most part, were martyred except for John. Right? And, it said, and he was sent not because they didn't try to martyr him. Right? They tried. They just, it just didn't work. And so then he gets exiled out to Patmos and such. Right? Right? But they tried to exile him, but they still served. It didn't matter to them. Right? Their obedience was not connected to their popularity. And so... Right? Jesus came in as one who came to serve. And that was his driving arch. He goes, it doesn't matter to me. All I want to do is see my Father's will accomplished for my life. Is that your heart's desire? Is that no matter what goes on to me, no matter if I'm popular or not popular, whether I'm on top of the world or not, it doesn't matter. I want God's will done. That's the driving force in me, is that God's will for my life would be accomplished tough question to answer for us sometimes. And I think it was a tough question for Jesus to answer sometimes. And stuff. He, he desires that. John 6, 38 says, I, you know, I've come to do my Father's will. Right? And he's, that's all that drove him. But he's in the garden and he's still going, is there another way, God? Is there another way? Is, is, is it possible 
Father, that there's a way that this could happen if I don't have to go to the cross, if I don't have to die, if I don't have to experience punishment. Right, so go ahead and flip with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 26. Right, we'll see Jesus in the garden. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26. Mind you, this is only four days later. Right? So it wasn't like it was weeks or months. It was four days later. Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Verse 39, And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Right? So if God is asking you to do something and your flesh is like, you know, I just, I just, I, I can't. I don't know if I want to. Is there any other way, God? There's nothing wrong with asking that prayer for God to do something different. Right? There's nothing wrong with that and interceding and going, Father, can't there be another way that this happens? That's okay. Right? That's not a lack of faith. That's not anything. Right? It's pouring out your heart as, as, a, as a son or a daughter going, Give me something else. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I want to. I don't, I don't know. My only caution was that is don't stop there. Because right? Jesus didn't stop there. He asked. He makes his request known. But is there any other way? But then he ends that, and he goes, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Right? There is the challenge for us, isn't it? And I don't want to go down this path. I don't want, can't you send somebody else to talk to my neighbor? Please, God. Isn't there any other way you can send somebody else to talk to my neighbor? I know you want me to go. I know you've been asking me to go. I know you're, it's been repeated. God, isn't there another way? Perfectly legitimate prayer. Do it. But at the end going, you know what, God, if, if there isn't any other way, if you're not willing to send anybody else, then all right, send me. And I'll go. I'm willing. And I know it's not going to make me popular. I know my enemies, you know, my neighbor's not going to like me, but that's okay. I'm not doing this because my neighbor is going to like me. I'm doing this because I'm obedient to you, and you've asked me to do it. Right? Is our obedience tied to our popularity, or is our obedience connected to our relationship with our Heavenly Father and Jesus? Right, there's the challenge for you when you're down that path. And then Jesus repeats it again. And he goes away. And then he comes back to his disciples in verse 40. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus, I mean, chances are I would have lashed out at my disciples, right? My followers are going, what in the heck is your problem? Right? It's like, can't you stay awake? Right? And he does. He challenges them. But he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour. Think about that for a minute couldn't watch with me one hour. So Jesus went away and he's praying for an hour. I think we make that prayer that he goes away and asks God, well, God, is there any other way? Take it away from me. No, okay, not my will, but your will. Okay, God gets up and comes back. No, he was gone an hour. And how, I mean, I, I find myself struggling to pray for an hour. I, there's times I'll sit there and I'm like, well, I'm going to pray. And I'll start praying and, you know, five, ten minutes later you fall asleep. Anybody else? Right? There's a few honest people out there, right? It's true. Right? And I wasn't even, you know, and yet we're sitting here and he's like, they can't do it. But then Jesus goes away again. Watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. A second time he went away and he prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. I just kind of reverses and says the same words again. I, I want it to pass, but if it can't pass, it's okay. Comes back, sees his disciples sleeping. He's like, oh, here we go again. They're still sleeping. Goes back a third time, prays the exact same words. But not my will, your will be done. Right? God, Jesus was all about his will being done. And Jesus knew why he was coming. Jesus knew he was coming to serve. He knew he was coming to lay down his life for you and me. And you go, how does he know that? Flip with me backwards in the book of Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 20. Jesus knew very clearly why he came. And he knew what his obedience meant. Matthew chapter 20. Right, there's James and, John's, James and John's mom. Right, Tries to get them a little one-up, if you will, with Jesus. Put them at your right and put them at your left. And 
Jesus was like, well, that's not mine to give you in this portion. But he comes to the end of that in verse 28. He says this, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Right? And so whether, every, whether Jesus received accolades or he received condemnation, Jesus was like, I know what my job is. I came to lay my life down. And my life down for the, for the people in that moment and his life down for you and me. And he came to lay down his life, to give it as a ransom. And he's asking you and I to lay down our lives. Right? In service to his kingdom. And then I think it'd be great if we just said, well, it's in service to his kingdom, but that service to his kingdom means in service to each other. Right? And that's where it gets hard. Now I have to lay my lives down for you guys. Right? That's not always easy because it's like there's things that go on and there's things that have happened and uh, do I want to do that? Jesus lays down his life. Are you and I willing to lay down our lives? And so there, the, like I said a moment ago, right, his popularity flips. He's everything, he's nothing. It might be the same with us at times. Right? We're everything. Life is going great. Everybody understands the gospel's moving, things are happening, and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, flip side, right, the next week you're over here and everything's falling apart. It's true. It's life. Right? The question is, is whether you're here in success or over here in the lack of popularity and you're being persecuted, is your heart the same? Do you still desire God's will to be done? Or when you get in that place of persecution, when you get in that place of struggle, when you get in that place of popularity and going, man, if I keep saying this, my friends aren't going to like me, my family's going to hate me, all this stuff is going to happen, does your obedience change? Does your desire change? It's no longer, my, you know, God, I want your will to be done. No, no, I want my will to be done because I want to get back in the good graces of these people. I want my popularity to go up. That's a dangerous spot, church. But that's not what he's asking. That's not the demonstration we've been given. Right? And Jesus is arrested and they throw him in, the, you know, put him out there and they, they put him to the cross and all that's going on. And the crowd says, crucify crazy thing about it, right? Think about it when he's on the cross and, and the soldiers and the people are crying out, right? If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And they taunt him and say, right, he saved others, but he couldn't save himself. Was Jesus able to save himself while he was on the cross? I think so, right? I think Jesus in them. yep, I'm off, see ya. And no issues done. I think he had all that power and authority within himself. It wasn't that he couldn't save himself, church. Right? Jesus most certainly could have saved himself. Right? Instead, right, he chose not to save himself. Why? Right? Why? Because of me? Because of you? And he could have. It wouldn't have taken much. Creator of heaven and earth, everything at his disposal, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. All of that's there. He's like, I could have got off the cross, no issue. Problem is, is, has he chosen to get off the cross? Had he chosen to go, you know what? I'm tired of not being popular. I'm tired of being the outcast. I'm tired of being the one being persecuted. I'm done. We'd be done. Right? Had he chose to give in to the popular opinion, we'd be done. We'd have no life. We wouldn't be here praising. We wouldn't be here looking forward to Resurrection Sunday. We'd be lost without hope. Instead, Jesus was obedient, regardless of popularity. Right? And he knew what his job was. I must give my life as a ransom. I must die that others might live. And I believe that, that like I said, I believe that message sunk into his disciples. Because you think about Peter day of Pentecost, right? Holy Spirit comes down, preaches a message, 3,000 are saved, everything is awesome. Popularity is through the roof. Right? All is good. Right? And God continues to add to their numbers daily, and all of this is taking place. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's the epitome. Everybody's like, that's great. And yet, eventually, Peter's crucified. 
Peter's popularity ran out. James's popularity runs out. Eventually, the world catches up and goes, you know what, Peter? We're done with you. We no longer want to hear what you've got to say. Right? There's enough people that finally swelled up and got Peter crucified. Got the disciples killed. And it happens with us sometimes, too. Right? Whether it's in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, in our churches, right? Eventually, right, there's, there's this chance that we might not be the popular one anymore. And in those moments, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue to be obedient? Or are you going to, are you, are you going to, are you going to, are you going to, you know, fluctuate a little bit? And go, ah, I don't have to be that serious about my faith. It's okay. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have to be sold out to Christ. I, I can, I can go to church and I can worship and I can pray in private, but. Do I really, God, do I really have to be the ambassador in my school? Do I really have to be the mouthpiece in my family? Do I, do I have to be the example, the shining light in my workplace? Can't I, just, can't I just soften that a little bit? It would make my life so much more comfortable if I could just be a little loud. Where's your obedience? Is it tied to popularity? Or is it tied to the will of the Father? It doesn't matter what my popularity is. It doesn't matter what the world says. Right? It's a check for us as we go through this. Right? Because for Jesus, it didn't matter what the crowd said. The only thing that mattered and was squarely before Jesus' mind's eye was the fact that my Father sent me down to die and to give my life as a ransom. That's enough for me. Is it enough for us? That God has asked me to do acts. And come what may, it doesn't matter. I'm in. Right? I'm obedient to that calling that his will might be completed in my life. And so I'll close with the three kind of recapping of three essential questions for this morning from these lessons. That the first one is, are you willing to do donkey duty? Are you willing to humbly serve no matter what God has asked you? Check yourself. Is there something that if God says to do it, you're like, eh, nope, not me. Not in. Chances are you need to you need to grow, right? God's trying to bring some humility into your life because there's nothing beneath you. Because there was nothing beneath me. Jesus goes, there was nothing below my, my my level. I don't care what it was I'm doing here. And so we have to check ourselves. Are we willing to do donkey duty? Are we willing to do the lowest of the low? Because that's what our Father asks of us. Secondly, Right? Do you serve to get the things of a successful life? Or do you serve because you know who you are? Right? Do we serve to get the things of the world? Right? What looks like success? What, what the world deems as success? Or do we serve because we know that we're children of the Most High? We serve because we know that we've been called to be ministers of reconciliation. We serve because we're ambassadors. We serve because Jesus gave us the example. Right? No other reason. Jesus laid it out for us. I mean, it, it is so crystal clear in the Gospel of John. I've left you an example that you should go do likewise. Whose feet are you washing? I thought somebody else's job. I think no. Right? I think Jesus has feet for every one of us to wash. There's some task that grates against our flesh. But he goes, that's what I'm asking you to do. I did it for you. And then lastly, are we going to be affected if our message is popular or not? Are we going to be affected? That is our obedience going to be affected based off whether our message is popular or not? Because right, I'm going to tell you right now, right, the gospel message in our society today is not going to be popular. It's just not. Right, if we're going to speak the unadulterated gospel, right, if we're going to tell people the fact that their sin is sinful and that they're lost and dead without Christ, and Christ is the only means of salvation through his life, death, and resurrection, right, that isn't going to be a popular message today. Right? It's just, it, it, we might as well prepare ourselves. It wasn't a popular message in Jesus' day. It wasn't a popular message in the early church. And it's not a popular message still today. But does the world need to hear it? Yes. 
right? They absolutely positively need to hear that truth. But when it becomes unpopular, when we start to get pushback, are we going to stop? Is our, be- or is our obedience to fulfilling God's will on our lives based off of what people think? based off of whether or not it affects my job or not. Based off of whether or not I get ridiculed in school or not. That's the challenge. Right? Does our message change? Right? Or are we simply going to live out God's purpose for our lives? And God's purpose for our lives, it, the reason we're still here is to give forth the message of reconciliation. Right? To share the gospel with people. That's why we're still here. That's why we're still taking in air, church. Right? If we, if we didn't need to go do that, right, then we'd be gone. God would have taken us home already. The fact that we're still here means there's work for us to do. The question is, are we willing to do that work? Go ahead and close out in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, I thank you for the picture of your triumphal entry, Jesus, where we get to see a humble servant king entering in on, on, on a cult of a donkey to, to show us this picture of humility, to show us this picture of peace, to give us the example that we don't need to come in with all pomp and circumstance to be effective. But it's out of humble, obedient hearts that you're glorified and that you work. Father, I pray that for each and every one of us here this morning that we would, we would truly look to your example, Jesus, of how you laid down your life how you gave it up as a ransom for many, and not that our lives are necessarily paying the ransom. You've already done that, but us laying down our lives draws people and points people back to you. Father, I pray that your will would be done in each one of our lives. I pray that each one of us here would be faithful ambassadors and ministers of reconciliation this week. Lord, I know that there'll be opportunities throughout this week. And I know, Lord, that if we're bold, if we're, if we're, if we're um, confident in speaking the truth in love, that it may not be the most popular message, but at the same time, God, I know that in this season especially, that people are receptive to that message, that your spirit is working, that your spirit is drawing people, and that we would have a boldness to share the truth. Lord, that we would be obedient to the calling no matter what the cost is. Holy Spirit, would you strengthen us this week with a constant reminder of the, of the example laid before us and that we would have the strength and the boldness and the power to walk in obedience to your call. That we too would go and do likewise. That we too would serve one another here in this building, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, for the glory of you. Not for our advancement of our kingdom, but for the advancement of your kingdom. Or that they too might come to meet you, Jesus. That they too might see the king who comes in and proclaims peace. Lead us and guide us down that path this week. In Jesus' name we pray.